students out there this evening that are excited to see their new principal as well. So with no further ado, I'm going to turn it over to the star of the show, the new principal of Gabrielino, Principal Nagar Mizani. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Simmons. Thank you so much, everyone, for being here. Good evening, everyone. Um, let me start off by saying how much I appreciate you giving up your evening, your time to be here, um, to be engaged and to be involved. I am very grateful for that. And I hope that by the end of the session, you find this uh, experience very fruitful. Um, I feel very humbled. I feel very um, filled with gratitude um, as the new principal of Gabrielino. And I take this opportunity with grace and with humility. Uh, and I look forward to working with students. I look forward to working with our wonderful staff. And I look forward with, uh, to working with our parents who are the heroes and heroines of their children's stories. Um, so with that said, before we get to the Q&A, um, if I may, I would like to share a little bit about myself and my leadership journey, my teaching and my leadership journey. So you learn a little bit about me and you're going to learn more about me as the year goes on. But I do think it's uh, important that you learn a, little bit about, learn a little bit about me this evening. So my really um, educational journey starts when I was 14 years old, uh, when I arrived to the United States as um, an immigrant, as a newcomer. Um, I was born and raised in Iran, in Tehran. And um, in 1999, myself, my mother and my brother migrated to the United States while my father stayed in Iran for an additional three years. It was in early, actually late 2002 that he was able to finally join us. Um, when I got to the United States, I did not know any English. Um, to say that I spoke rudimentary English would be an overstatement. And so that school experience, as you may be able to imagine, was very chaotic was somewhat anxiety provoking, but it was not um, I, but it was not without the benevolence of when many of my teachers who took a liking to me, took me under their wing and they supported me throughout my high school years as I was learning English, as I was acculturating, going through the process of acculturation, which many of you may know, um, migration can be a traumatic experience and acculturation and mastering a new language is not an easy task. So those teachers really guided me. They supported me. They recognized a love of reading in me. So they gave me young adult books to read. And really that is how I learned the English language. And I, and I use the word learned um, uh, generously here, because I'm still learning. Uh, once an English language learner, always an English language learner, right? Um, so through those books, um, I was able to uh, gain literacy, gain literacy knowledge of the English language, and was able to see myself as a future college student and a future, future potential teacher. I had always loved literature. I find a lot of comfort in words. I find a lot of comfort in stories, in storytelling and also reading stories, in poetry, uh, both written and spoken. And so I always knew that I wanted to pursue that in college. And I always knew that I wanted to be a civil servant. I wanted to help others. I wanted to serve others. And I thought to myself, what a great way of combining the two and pursuing English um, as a major, literature as a major, and secondary education as a minor. There was, however, um, an obstacle in my way, and that was that all throughout my high school and my college years, I was actually undocumented. I did not have the opportunity um, to be documented, a documented high school student and a documented college student. And it was not until the senior year of my college that I was able to um, 
attain um, status and be able to eventually receive my citizenship in the United States and become a citizen. Um, but that was incredible for me to be able to gain that my senior year of college. Um, although my high school and my college years were extremely difficult because of this obstacle, um, it, it, getting being granted status was really a miracle for me because it allowed me to pursue teaching. It allowed me to pursue what I really wanted to do, which was be of service to others. So from there, I went to, I ended up actually at a really tough school in Denver. At, at the time, the school was the lowest performing school in Denver. Um, the, per, the year prior I got there, there had been a stabbing in the cafeteria and a child had passed away as a result of the stabbing. They had brought in a new principal who was kind of cleaning house. Um, he went on to become the chancellor of DC public schools. He hired me and I learned a great deal under him. Um, but unfortunately, as he left to pursue further opportunities, the school kind of fell apart. And in the span of the four years that I was there, we had six principals and a number of different assistant principals. And there was a lot of instability in the school. Um, and so I think year after year, I kept coming back because I just had built such strong relationships with my students, with my scholars, as well as their families, and I just could not leave them. My, the last um, year that I was there, the district decided to close down the school and uh, replace the school with three smaller autonomous charter schools. Um, that to this day remains the most significant traumatic experience of my career, going through a school closure where everyone lost their jobs, the students were displaced, they had to go to other schools, they had to find other communities, and we were all separated. Um, it was hard, um, but after um, I did end up at, um, uh, happened to be the highest performing um, high school in Denver. And really my experience at that school has really formed my leadership. And it is the very reason that I'm sitting here before you today. Um, the school was very similar to Gabrielino. It was very high performing. It had a number of, continues to have a number of nationally recognized programs. It was a high school of 2,600 scholars. So it was a comprehensive high school. Um, and it was a very, very magical place, incredibly magical place. And I was there for six years and I learned tremendously under my principal and my assistant principal, both of whom really supported my development as a leader, um, as a teacher, as a pedagogical um, expert, if you may say. And I, I really owe a great deal of gratitude to them because it is because of them that, that I occupy the seat. Um, so while I was there, um, my second year, I became the chair of the English department. Two years after, I became um, an instructional coach for the, for the building. And um, my um, second to last year there, the assistant principal there was promoted to be a principal at a sister school. And she approached me and asked me to go with her and become her AP. But it had always been very important to me to at least teach for a decade before I left the classroom. And so I told her, I still wanna teach another year at the very least. And she said, no worries, I'm gonna come back and I'm gonna recruit you again. So the following year she came back and asked me to move and be her AP. And at that point I was ready to do so. Her school was very interesting. Um, Denver was a refugee or is a refugee resettlement city. So her school had the largest newcomer center, which means that it was a magnet school for all the refugee students of high school age who were coming in and settling in Denver, Colorado. So these were students who spoke a variety of languages. We had about 69 languages spoken. Many of them were Scythe students. They have had significantly interrupted formal education because they had either spent significant time in refugee camps or they had gone to school for a few years in their home countries and then had been hiding in tunnels um, or elsewhere and had not gone to any school whatsoever. And then they would get to us as high school students. And not only they did not have literacy in L2, but they were also lacking literacy in L1. 
So it was my job to work with that team because I was the director of the newcomer center, as well as my other assistant principal duties and, and other teachers who taught sheltered courses to really develop literacy uh, in these scholars in L2, but also support literacy in L1. Um, and um, I ran the entire program. I worked with the International Rescue Committee, with the Office of Refugee Resettlement. Um, we had a, a variety of resources for these scholars because as we know, it takes a village. Um, and there I learned a lot, tremendously about how to deal with students who've had significant trauma. So I learned a lot about trauma-informed schooling and trauma-informed care. Um, as with all things, life happens. Um, my then um, fiance, who's now my husband, was offered a faculty position at a university in um, California and, and we were not in a position to turn that down. And so we moved here and I landed in LA not really knowing um, any professional um, contacts or any networks. And I landed at Alliance Public Schools at a school named Ochi High School on Crenshaw and Slauson. And I have been an assistant principal there for the past four years. And I've learned tremendously there. Prior to, to my tenure there, I really didn't know much about um, charter schools other than the debate between district versus charter that I feel really proficient in, but I had not experienced charter schools. So I saw it as an opportunity to go and learn. And what I did learn is that charter schools, um, they do some things really well. They have figured out formulas for some, some things, uh, the bulk of it being post-secondary readiness, particularly for underserved and underrepresented students. So how do we get underserved and underrepresented students to selective and highly selective universities? Not only get them there, but also support them throughout their four years there so they can matriculate successfully. And so I was very, very grateful for that opportunity. But at the end of this year, I did feel like I was ready and I did uh, share with my principal that I feel like I am ready to take the next step in my journey. And that really brought me to Gabrielino. And that is um, why I'm sitting before you filled with gratitude. Thank you, Nagar. I'll turn it back over to our moderator uh, this evening, the fabulous Dr. Joan Perez. Thank you so much, Nagar, for sharing um, your story with us uh, of your educational journey. We have some questions that when people registered for the webinar this evening, they submitted ahead of time. And we also have the chat open. So we're going to start with the questions that we have um, already seen pre-submitted here. Some of them are similar. So what I'm going to do is ask you those that are similar um, in fashion um, first, and then um, if there are only any outliers, I'll ask you those as well. Okay. So the first question is, what are your priorities for your first two years at Gabrielino? And what are your plans to strengthen the culture and safety and well-being? That is a very, very good question. So I know that Gabrielino uh, is known for its academic performance. Uh, I know that it is known for its many of its nationally recognized elective programs and extracurricular activities. So my first priority is to um, ensure that all of our scholars, that number one, we maintain and grow that. That's very, very important. And number two, ensuring that all of our scholars have equitable access to rigorous courses, to meaningful um, elective courses and to extracurricular activities. Because the end goal for us is to always ensure that our high school scholars are competitive for selective and highly selective universities. And not only are they competitive and they, we can get them there, but also that we have over the course of the four years that they've been with us, we have given them and they've acquired the skills necessary to be able to inch closer to successful graduation from college. 
So that is really my goal um, for the first two years. That will be a big focus for me. And I know that the district and um, Dr. Perez and Mr. Simmons have spoken to me extensively about this, but the focus on equity and also making sure, and I, I wanna emphasize this, that all of our scholars have access um, to, to those programs and to those uh, rigorous academic courses and are inching closer to college graduation. Thank you, Ms. Mazzoni. Okay, so along the same lines, what are some aspects that you plan to improve upon? That's a great question. So I think um, I don't want to be um, arrogant in my response. I think for me, before I can authentically answer that, I have to listen. Um, I just yesterday met with some of the staff for the first time. I have not had a, a, a lot of opportunity to meet a lot of stakeholders and conduct a listening tour. It is a goal of mine to conduct a listening tour and ascertain areas of growth. And then based on that collaboratively work on those areas of growth. But what I can say is I know that equity is a big focus for us. And so when it comes to equity, I hope to work collaboratively with all constituents to ensure that we do not lose sight of that focus and that we can continue to provide the supports and the resources necessary to make sure that all of our practices are equitable, but also through the listening tour, ascertain areas of growth and collaboratively work on those and have solutions and incremental due dates and deadlines and action steps that are going to get us closer um, to the solutions that we come up with together. Thank you so much. Okay, our next category of questions. Um, is, is, is about the staff, the teaching staff. How do you see yourself in collaboration with the staff? So I, as I mentioned previously, I met some of the staff for the first time yesterday. And as I shared with Dr. Perez actually earlier, and I say this very, very genuinely, I was very overwhelmed by the amount of warmth and support that I received in my meet and greet. Um, I know that Gabrielino is a very established school. I know that many of the staff members there have been there for many, many years, for decades, for longer than I have been present in the educational field. And, um, you know, it would be very normal, it would be very expected for them to be a little bit suspicious of a new person coming in, of a new leader coming in, an outsider coming in. Yet, I was not confronted with that yesterday. That was not my experience yesterday. Yesterday, when I left Gabrielino, I felt like, my gosh, I, I already feel like I'm home. So I only hope to further build that relationship, to further strengthen that relationship, because I do know that there is a wealth of institutional knowledge and institutional wisdom and at Gabrielino. I plan to tap into it and I plan to continue to build trust and close relationships with my staff so that we can work collaboratively to move the school even further. What I do know, the, is that trust is key and paramount to that work. And I know that the onus is on me as a leader to create that environment for my staff. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is about vi your vision as a principal. So what was it about Carolino that made you wanna be the principal here? And what is your vision for the school going forward? That is a great question. Um, I think I mentioned this a little bit in the story, in the background story that I shared. Gabrielino is very similar. So when I was in Denver, um, I was in three, my, during my 11 years, I was in three high schools. All of them were large comprehensive high schools that focus obviously on core content classes, but also had very rich elective offerings and they had very rich um, 
extracurricular activities that they would offer the scholars in order to make the scholars competitive. So when I applied to Gabrielino, um, it reminded me of my experiences in Denver. It reminded me of home. One of the reasons I uh, told my principal um, at Ochi High School um, in South Central Los Angeles, I was ready to go this year um, is because charter schools tend to be smaller. And because they tend to be smaller, they do not offer a lot of electives to their student body. And I have tried in the past four years, I tried really, really hard to start a robust um, visual and performing arts program. Um, and you know, I, I, I was somewhat successful by the time I was able to finish the master schedule this year, we were offering uh, play production, photography, painting and drawing. And when I got there, we didn't have any of that. We just had art one. And so I'm really proud of that work because I kept pushing for it, pushing for it, pushing for it, because it is something I really believe in. Visual and performing arts is something that I'm really, really passionate about. So that spoke to me. And I know that you have a very robust program. I know that you have a VAPA advisory council. And so I, that spoke to me. I, I felt like I wanted to be a part of that. I felt like I could be an advocate for that. Um, and so I, I look forward to that work and I look forward to seeing students perform and shine on stage and beyond. Thank you. Okay, our next question is about communication protocols. Parents want to know how um, you plan on communicating to parents and students and what they can look forward to in terms of the different methodologies you'll use. This is an excellent question because a free flow of communication and a streamlined um, way of communicating with parents and scholars and the community at large, it's significant to our success as a school community. So um, I, obviously there are the traditional methods of, you know, parent letters, emails, phone calls, but I also understand that this new age requires us to be more technologically advanced and technologically savvy. Um, research shows that many families, uh, whether it is related to school or otherwise, uh, many individuals get their information through social media. So whether it is Facebook, whether it is Instagram, whether it is an app such as Parent Square, that is where folks are getting information. So I wanna make sure that our website is updated, make sure that our Instagram page is updated, our Facebook page is updated, um, so that parents have multiple avenues to get the information that they need, in addition to the traditional models that typically schools spouse. So employing a variety of avenues for parents to have uh, timely, information to be able to make the best decisions for their scholars. Thank you. Um, our next question is a bit of a, a, a tricky one because we um, have kind of introduced courses for the fall, but we're still working on master schedule, but it, it, it's a bit of a challenge that the, a parent brings up. So in for 22-23 semester AP Chinese classes at six period, um, this causes a conflict with sports. What are your thoughts on that? And where are we? Uh, you mentioned that you have a lot of background knowledge with master scheduling. Where are we with um, maybe moving forward and kind of thinking through these kinds of challenges? Thank you for that question. So that was brought to my attention that the master schedule still needs a, a little bit of work. Obviously, best practice is to have the master schedule committed and ready to go prior to the end of um, the spring semester. Um, and hopefully moving forward, we can definitely make that happen. Um, but we're not there and that's okay. Um, I do plan on reaching out to my department chairs. It has to be a collaborative process. I can't just go in and make a unilateral decision and change things. That would not be good for anyone. So I want to make sure that constituents are involved. So it is my goal to reach out uh, to our um, department chairs by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, 
at the very latest by the end of the day on Monday um, to bring them together if they are available and willing um, to kind of look over the master schedule to shift some things that maybe need to be shifted around. I also know that as an outsider, I have a lot to learn from our department chairs and the wisdom and the knowledge that they have. So I will need to do some listening before I can make those um, final decisions collaboratively with that team. But that is something that we are working on and I wanna assure you that we're going to address it. And I, I, I would advise you not to reach out to them on Monday because Monday is the 4th of July, right. so maybe Tuesday. Tuesday. <laughs> yes, yes, thank you for that. Yeah. All right, okay, the next question is, what difference can you make to keep Gaprolino safe considering what's going on in our country right now? Um, that's a great question. So I assume um, this is referring to the recent mass shooting that happened in Texas, uh, in Uvalde. Um, what I will say is that for any large, for any school, but particularly for a large comprehensive high school, it is essential that national, state, local, and district safety and security protocols are followed with fidelity. And so we will be following those with fidelity. I want to make sure that you hear that from me and rest assured that I understand that my first priority is to keep your scholars safe. That is the first priority and I understand that. In addition to that, what I want to say in my experience at large high schools, um, in my experience with high school students, actually high school students and, and parents are great partners in letting us know things that are happening in real time so we can get ahead of the situation. I used to work with a dean of students who was incredible. And he always used to say, keep your ears to the streets. Always used to say that. He used to say that to students. He used to say that to the staff. He used to say that to our families. Because many times we would hear things from students and from families, and we would get ahead of a potentially a problematic situation before the situation escalated. So what I want to encourage families and students is come to us. Obviously my job is to make sure that I am uh, the trusting adult, a trusting adult in the building so that students feel safe and comfortable coming to me and sharing things with me. But it is also very important that you speak to your scholars about the importance of sharing potentially um, compromising situations so we can address them before they become um, drastic. Thank you. We've talked a little bit about connections with staff and how you'll be reaching out with parents and other stakeholders. I'm just curious if you could just elaborate on just your, your plans or your strategies um, that you've used in the past to, to reach out to students and connect with students and, and build that relational trust with them as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to speak a little bit about my experience with restorative justice, because I think my experience with restorative justice has really allowed me to continue to maintain a connection with scholars once I left the classroom. The classroom is a beautiful place. It is a cocoon because it is you and your students and it is safe. And it doesn't really matter what's happening elsewhere. Learning happens because it's you and your students and you are in control of that small space. It's very sacred. Once you leave the classroom and I experienced this as a first year AP, that becomes a lot harder. Um, because you have to deal with a lot more than just being a single teacher in a single classroom. What I found was approaching student discipline, approaching scholar conflict, approaching staff scholar conflict in a restorative way, showing a willingness to facilitate restorative conversations, to have restorative dialogues, allowed me to build a very, very robust connection to scholars. And I hope to continue to employ those restorative practices to be able to connect with my scholars and their families. 
oftentimes in leadership, you find yourself in a position where a student and a parent is in your office um, for something that is great, something that is less than ideal. As a leader, I have to capture that opportunity and seize that moment to build connections with the scholar so that the scholar feels like they are being given a second chance, that they can be reinvested in school and re-engage with the community. Because ultimately what we want is highly engaged scholars. So that is one way that I've always utilized to reach out to our scholars. And then other ways is being present at uh, outside of school events, being present at dance recitals, as mu at plays, uh, performances, music performances, games, sporting events. And there's a different level of connection. There's a level of different level of intimacy that happens. And just seeing scholars in that element, whether they are performing or whether they are spectators. And then really being present, I think ultimately on campus as a leader, you have to be visible, you have to be present. When students are walking through uh, hallways during passing period, acknowledging them, saying hello to them, learning their names um, in the e you know, in the afternoon when they are released, like saying goodbye to them in the morning as they come in, in saying hello to them. So being a presence, being visible also creates that connection. Thank you. Those are primarily the questions that were submitted. If I didn't ask them exactly the way people put them, um, we have, oh, hold on, just, just one more that just came in. What is your experience with AVID? Actually, I know a lot about AVID. AVID is advancement um, via individual determination. So it is, um, and, and again, um, this was my experience in Denver, but it is a program for typically middle of the road scholars um, who we want to get to be high performing scholars who we want to get ready for selective and highly selective colleges. So those are scholars that receive additional support um, during the college application process, additional support in studying uh, skills, additional support with um, navigating some of the trenches of high school in environments where otherwise they may not have had that opportunity. So AVID provides that opportunity for those middle of the road scholars. So I came from schools that had really strong AVID programs. Um, I was never an AVID teacher. I cannot sit here and tell you that, but I do have a, a great deal of familiarity with the program. Okay. Before we close out the evening, there are some questions in the chat um, that people have been submitting while we've been talking. And I'm wondering, Mr. Furta, if you could facilitate any of those questions. We've got a few, we've got about 20 more minutes. Okay. Well, thank you, Dr. Perez, and, and good to see you, Ms. Nazani. Um, just two questions that I'm seeing in the chat right now. And the first was just wanting to know a little bit more about your background, uh, Ms. Mazzani. Um, asking where you received your administrative credential and um, just maybe a little, I know you went over in your, your introduction, but where you were a principal or assistant principal at what schools? Definitely. So uh, I will start with my educational background. So I'll address the former uh, part of the question and then the latter part of the question. So I uh, received my administrative credential from Denver University from the uh, Morgridge College of Education. Um, and I cleared my credential through UCLA. And then, sorry, I apologize. No the latter part of the question, which was, where was I an assistant principal? I, in Denver, I was an assistant principal at South High School. Um, that was where the Newcomer Center was. It's a nationally recognized uh, Newcomer Center. It's been written about extensively. Um, and, Recently in LA, I was with Alliance College Ready Public Schools. Specifically, I was an assistant principal for four years at Alliance William and Carol Ochi High School in South Central Los Angeles. Okay, thank you. And there's still more coming in. So I'm gonna go back and ask the one that came in first. 
Um, this has to do with block scheduling. And um, there's, there's somebody asking, um, you know, there was research that looked at block scheduling as a way to support our students. Um, ultimately, that wasn't what was selected as the scheduling. And uh, just wondering your thoughts on block scheduling and how you might look at that question um, going forward. So I have a, a lot of experience with block scheduling um, in uh, where I was an assistant principal for the for the last four years. We had block scheduling. Uh, I've also experienced alternate block schedulings where three days you have 50 minute periods and then two days you have alternating blocks. Um, so I've experienced actually a lot with block scheduling. Um, I understand that people are passionate either for it or not for it. I think some uh, drawbacks from the teacher perspective, at least from what I've heard, is that sometimes those instructional uh, blocks can be very, very long. And uh, what, I, what I have heard from teacher feedback, it is hard to keep students engaged for that long of a period. Um, actually, at my previous school, um, where I am coming from, we used to have 120 minute, 20 minute block classes, and we had to shift that to 105 minute block classes based on teacher feedback. So that is a drawback, but a pro to that is while well, you get students for an extended period of time uninterrupted. So a lot of learning and engagement can take place. So I do see both sides. Um, same goes to 50 minute uh, periods. Uh, some people say you can get a lot done, others do not agree. Um, I think for me, I would not be able to make that decision unilaterally. I think I will need to engage my constituents first. I will need to survey the scholars. I do think it's really, really important that we survey the scholars and see what they are telling us and really rely on their experiences as we are making um, potentially altering decisions. We need to listen to the staff and get their feedback and their experiences and then ultimately consult our parents and guardians and then finally consult research. I, I really appreciate bringing research into this because that's also very important. It's, it has, it's a decision that has to be made collaboratively. And if that is a decision that we're going to make or decide to make, it will be a decision that will be made collaboratively. It will not be a unilateral decision. Sorry, these questions are pouring in and I'm gonna apologize because I am paraphrasing the question. So um, I'm just, uh, they're, they're getting a little long. So I'm just trying to um, sure. do that. So I'm, I'm gonna apologize to the folks asking the questions. Um, one, uh, Participant uh, wanted to thank you for bringing up restorative justice. And um, you know, although we have psychologists and counselors on campus, um, it may not, it's still not enough. What more can we do for our community? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I think that we can actually tap in, um, and this is something that I've been meaning to, and I look forward to speaking to Dr. Prez and Mr. Simmons about. I think we can actually tap into our staff. So potentially our school counselors, potentially our interested teachers um, and send them to restorative training, um, send them to circle trainings. Um, circles I, is something that I'm really passionate about. I would actually love to bring it to campus. Um, I think implementation of circles is extremely meaningful in the way it allows our scholars to practice mindfulness, to learn to regulate their own emotions, to become in tune with how they are feeling and be able to seek help for their feelings when they need to. So I would love to bring that in. I do have experience in running circles. I do have circle training, but I would love to expand that to my staff and not just the social worker, the school psychologist, but the counselors, interested teachers, staff members. So multiple people are armed with the knowledge of running circles. And hopefully that is something that slowly we can begin to implement with our student body. And ultimately the goal is to have student facilitators. So the goal is to train our scholars. So our scholars become facilitators and 
uh, circle keepers, which would be incredibly powerful for our student body. Thank you. I'm going to combine two questions that are kind of similar. One, one is asking about student discipline, another is acting, asking about um, you know, staff and, and holding folks accountable to, to the direction that, that the school is going. And so I think maybe that's a good one to kind of answer together in terms of how you'll work on holding both students and staff accountable to expectations. That is a great question. I think I'm going to separate the two. I think I'll speak about scholars and then I, I will speak about staff. I think in universally, you hold people accountable by setting an example. Universally, you set an example of what accountability looks like. You lead by example, you yourself as a leader are accountable to your students and your school and, and your staff. And by holding yourself accountable, through leading by example, it becomes easier to hold others accountable. So that's the first thing I would say. I would actually say that I would start with myself. I would first hold myself accountable, ensure that I am leading by example. And then when it comes to scholars, we want to communicate expectations from the very start. Because when expectations are communicated with clarity and then implemented, with fidelity and consistency, then scholars know what is expected of them. So when they break expectations, what we can say is that you have caused harm. How are you going to repair the harm you have caused, right? And, and through restorative practices, we can teach them how they, through whether it's through community service, whether it is through, um, um, a written apology, whether it is through service to others, they can hopefully repair the harm that they have caused. So again, be very clear with expectations and implement with fidelity and consistency. And then if there's harm caused, try to utilize restorative approaches to help the child, allow the child the opportunity to repair the harm that has been caused. With the staff, again, I would hold myself accountable first, but if I see that a staff member is not following expectations, I think I would follow up with a conversation to just see what is going on, what potential supports may the staff member need to be able to meet those expectations, and then I would, um, implement those supports, I would offer those supports. Because oftentimes when you support people, people begin to meet expectations. If supports are not met, uh, or excuse me, supports are there, but expectations are, are not met, then I would have, you know, um, other channels that I would explore. But in my experience, I have found that supporting people goes a long way treating people with kindness and compassion goes a long way but ultimately as the leader you set the example and you are you are the role model for the campus so by hopefully holding yourself accountable and leading by example you are inspiring others thank you Ms. Mazzani. um lighter question um how do you like music and sports i love music uh, although I cannot say that I'm a connoisseur and I enjoy um, sports moderately and I'm not a connoisseur. But what I will tell you is that I love students. And so wherever students shine, I am happy to support them. So, you know, we all have our preferences. Obviously I have a greater preference and I think that has come across for um, visual and performing arts, with mu for music, uh, for dance. Um, and my knowledge of sports tends to be a little bit less than my knowledge in, in those other areas, but that is irrelevant. What is relevant is my love for students, me wanting to see students succeed and me wanting to support whatever avenue that that may um, rest in and always cheering them on and always supporting them. Great, well, I, know, I know everybody will be excited to see you on the sidelines. Uh, 
Definitely. You know, football season starts in the late uh, late summer. I don't think I see any new questions that we didn't already touch on. Unless anybody else is seeing anything in the chat, I think I think um, I think that was that was it. Great job, Ms. Mazzani. <laughs> and, and I think everyone is seeing um, so much of what we saw, just how much you bring to the table. Uh, there's not too many times that, you know, I finished an interview um, and I know um, our cabinet team did when we feel um, we have so much to learn from you um, and you are going to be such a great resource because um, your experience um, and knowledge you bring in some areas that we're working on is is uh, further ahead than where we're at. So you are going to be a tremendous resource uh, for this district. And so I, I am excited. Um, we welcome you. Uh, as I stated earlier, this is a, a, a beginning of, of a journey and, and the start of many chances to interact with Ms. Mazzani. Um, as I said, you'll be meeting with the PTSA next week. We'll have a live uh, meet and greet session. Um, it was just so fun getting together yesterday with the Gabrielino staff and um, uh, meeting with them and, and seeing you, getting to know them. Um, and I can tell right away, um, there was um, some great energy in the air. I know we all felt it. Um, I can't wait to work with you. I know our parents um, are going to uh, love working with you. And I already saw the magic between you and the students yesterday when you interacted with the student council. You have a way with kids. Um, and, uh, you know, they know uh, by looking at you and, and hearing you that you care about them already. And I just saw that yesterday. And so I'm so excited. So thank you for thank coming you. tonight thank and taking so time out of your busy schedule and good luck on your first day on the job tomorrow. I'll come down and visit you. So we'll chat for a while. Thank you. And thank you to our interpreters, cabinet, Joan, as usual, Dr. Perez, our moderator doing a fantastic job, Larry getting the questions, our liaisons for helping out tonight. And of course, all of you parents and students out there that were looking forward to this chance uh, to meet your new principal. Thank you all for your continued support. I think we have an amazing leader and I think you all will be happy um, as we go down this road and begin this new journey together. So thank you so much. As always, we're available uh, for email and I know Ms. Mazzani will be as well and she'll be happy to answer questions as I know she has an open door policy. Um, so thank you all. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful, safe and fun 4th of July. Stay cool and we look forward to seeing you all soon. Have a nice evening. Thank you, everybody. Might I add, we will we have recorded this, so we'll be posting it up on our website tomorrow. For anybody that missed it or you know another family that didn't wasn't able to join tonight, please let them know that the recording will be there up on the website and you can access it tomorrow. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you, thank you. Good night, everybody. Good night. Have a few more participants. Thank you. Have a great evening. Happy fourth. One more. All right, guys, have a great evening. I will um, work with Eric in the morning to get this link up on the website. And thank you, thank you, Nagar, for just your poise and your willingness to do this so quickly. Of course, of course. You were great. <laughs> you handled all those questions coming in, bam, bam, bam. Thank um, you. And you got some great uh, notes there in the chat. Uh, people so impressed and so. Thank you so great. much. 
Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. And thank you to our interpreters. You are heroes. So thank you. I, I do, you know, I used to interpret for my parents. I know how hard that is. So thank you. Awesome. All right. You guys have a great evening. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, liaisons. I'll see you tomorrow. Sounds uh, good. I'll, I'll pop by and see how you're doing. Sounds good. Bye. Okay, Bye -bye. great. Thank you.